The honky tonks in Texas were my natural second home. Where you tip your hat to the ladies and the rows of San Antonio. Well, I grew up on music we call Western Swing. It don't matter who's in Austin, Rick Barnes is still the king. Since 2003, this is the Sports Source, East Tennessee's number one sports talk show. Presented by Hype Wrench, and by Junk Be Gone, and by the Garza Law Firm. With your host, John Pennington. The Sports Source starts now. Good Sunday morning, and it doesn't matter who's in Austin. Rick Barnes is still the king. A little something for the new SEC <laughs> rivals in town, Texas, and their fans. That had to be a fun one for Rick Barnes, even though he said afterwards that it really was just another game. He loves everybody there, et cetera. There had to be a little piece of him that enjoyed that. Uh, and Tennessee fans, if you thought you were nervous last night, imagine if you were Texas fans looking at the guy you ran out who then came back and exited you from a tournament and who has run a better program than Texas has had since he arrived here. Uh, we're in the Junk Begone Studios for today's edition of the Sports Source. We're going to be talking about Tennessee's win last night. We're going to be talking about them going to the Sweet 16. We're going to give you the same analytics that coaches use. We're going to show you uh, how Tennessee compares with the remaining teams in the Midwest region. Purdue and Utah State play later today, so they're still both in there. Uh, it's going to be an interesting show. We've even got some football at the end of the show. We'll make our picks. How far is Tennessee going to go? What are we thinking about their final four chances now? Let's get into it. First segment of this show is brought to you by our friends at the Garza Law Firm. And there is no bigger supporter of the Vols than Marcos Garza. There's also no bigger part of the community than the Garza Law Firm. And most importantly, there's no better group of attorneys in all of East Tennessee. So if you're looking for an attorney who's a part of the community, who's right here, you need to get with the Garza Law Firm. Get in touch with Marcos Garza and his team. Visit GarzaLaw.com today to learn more about this long-term part of our East Tennessee community. All right, another long-time part of our community is the Sports Source, <laughs> and the guys who make the Sports Source are Josh Ward, Vince Ferrara, Will West, Chuck Cavaliers. We got Bob Hodge waiting in the wings. Um, we got plenty to cover today, so let's just dive right in. Let's take a look at the bracket that's remaining in the Midwest, if we can. There you go. You see, Purdue gets the uh, gets their logo up there, but they still got a game with Utah State. Uh, but as it stands, it's probably going to be Purdue and Gonzaga going to Detroit. And they would be waiting in the Elite Eight round, the winner of that game, for the winner of Creighton and Tennessee. Oregon almost got Creighton last night, lost in double overtime. It would have been, on paper, it would have been a nice win for the Vols if they got to go up against Oregon instead of Creighton. But they didn't get it break their way. Uh, didn't have it break their way last night. So it will be the number three seed, Creighton. We'll tell you more about them as we go through the show. Tennessee survives an atrocious shooting night last night. They uh, shot 12% from three-point range, but that didn't deter them from continuing just to fire them up there as soon as they got up court. Three of 25 from outside the arc. Uh, they wow. were aided by Texas going seven of 23 from threes. If Texas hits two more threes last night, we're talking about a whole different game. Uh, Vols won that one at the free throw line, sealing it with 15 of 18 from the line, including seven there in the final minute or so with Adu and Connect. You also had 15 points off turnovers to Texas five. Right. So, I mean, if you're looking for a difference in the game, probably defense. Josh Ward, I'm going to start with you, and we'll do what we always do. We're going to talk about the biggest takeaways in this game. What are yours? By the way, those free throws clutch late. Jonas Adu, they get, Texas got the guy at the line they wanted, yeah. and he knocked him down. So a ton of credit there. Uh, my biggest takeaway would be that Tennessee won a game that we've been asking for years. Can they win that kind of game playing defense, rebounding the basketball, struggling to hit shots. I don't think any of us would have predicted 12% yeah. from three and you're advancing against a team with a good amount of talent in Texas, and they did it. And uh, a guy like Josiah Jordan-James, who's had his ups and downs, he hits a couple shots late, he plays good defense, nine rebounds. He gets a rebound on a jump ball where his strength is able to hold on to it when a couple of guys are going after it. Jump ball's in Tennessee's favor, so a little bit of luck. But games where we've seen Tennessee fall because of the way things went, they bounce back Tennessee's way, and they have the ability to score, shoot better, obviously, than that. But defense won them the game on the way to the Sweet 16. 
they checked boxes. I mean, we wondered about, honestly, I wondered about their free throw shooting mm -hmm. because it kind of, you know, went down slightly as the year went on. And the guy that was shooting 62% made clutch free throws down the stretch. And then also, could they close games at that? And then also, this talk about this team is so reliant on Dalton Connect. Eight, uh, Ziegler and, and Connect only had eight points in the first half. They're still up nine. And they got to the finish line without him dominating, having to take yeah. over the game. Um, and we've seen this before. This reminded me of the Alabama game a little bit, right, where defense held on and won that game, and they held off runs. Little runs, and then they had an answer. And they didn't let their offensive issues impact them on the defensive end. Those are very much positives in what NCAA tournament is, is off script often. I thought it looked like, you know, we'll see what happens in the next game. Each game's its own thing. But it yeah. seemed for one night they learned their lesson against Mississippi State. It's like their, their bad offense didn't kill the defense right. this time around. Uh, and it's the team we talked about earlier this season. For the fir November through February, we talked about a team that could beat you when it's hitting lights out, as it did against St. Peter's. We, we were talking about a team that when it needs Dalton Connect to, to carry them, they ca he carries them. And it's a team that can win with defense. All right, we've been asking where's it gone. It kind of slipped at the end. I know we've talked about is their defense overrated? Is it falling apart? <laughs> it came through last night. Yeah. It did, and, and they survived the game that they always lose. Survive right? in the, advance. That, that, that fit last night. Advance. Yes, yeah. and, and it was. But Barnes... When Tennessee goes home, you've been talking about this and showing stats about this a lot, yeah. John, over the last few weeks. When Tennessee goes home, it's usually something where they they shoot 20% from beyond the arc. They shot 12% beyond the arc, and they survived this game. They had a nine-point lead. They blew the nine-point lead. Yet they still survived, and they this and time it didn't lead, yeah. get them. So I look at this and say a lot of good takeaways. I am concerned moving forward with this poor lose you've shot last five or six games. But you survive the thing that always knocks you out in the tournament. Look, you got to hope that you don't see it twice, right? That's right. the one That's right. big thing. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and one thing, the more I watch Tennessee play now, I think, boy, they really need to get off to a good start. It seems like if they do that, they're going to be okay. But if they're not, I, I don't feel near as good. And let's, let's, one name we need to mention, Tobey Awaka. Yeah, yeah. I mean, four or five from the field, two or two. He came in, and here, the first round game, what happened? He had like a lower leg kind of thing. Went in, oh, but he came back in. Is he going to be available? What if you hadn't had Tobey Awaka last night? Yeah. That could have been a whole different story for what he did early. We'll go ahead and show you some of the uh, numbers, shot charts and stuff from uh, last night. There's your team stats. You can kind of look at those about 15, 20 seconds each. Uh, but you guys have mentioned it. I had notes here. Dalton Connect wound up with 18, but seven of those are the free throw line. So he only gets you 11. Ziegler didn't have a big night scoring. Adu and Awaka combined for 21. James adds nine. Right. Okay, I feel pretty good. If you tell me going in that you're going to get 30 points from Adu, Awaka, and James, okay, because I think most nights Connect and Ziegler are going to give you more than they did last night. Uh, it's amazing that Tennessee could continue to fire up that many threes. Uh, <laughs> you know, and Rick Barnes said after the game, we, we, wanted, we told him, don't stop shooting. You know, the Mississippi State, everybody kept passing up the, th the shots. There's a fine line between, and you saw the blue <laughs> Tennessee shot chart there was as icy blue as I've ever seen. But there's a fine line between keep shooting and can we work the ball inside more right, a little right, bit? I exactly. Mean, when, when you're, maybe when you're 3 of 22, you say, <laughs> let's stop. Let's go inside. I was just screaming at the television a little bit about all the three-point balls. I actually, John, did not have a big problem with it. I'll tell you why. One, they needed those late threes from Meshack and James, even though they were terrible because that ended up being more than the difference in the game. It, they had 25 three-point shots. They had 40 from two-point range, right? They are – they lose – when they lose – they take more threes and twos. That was not the yep. case. I thought they still were going inside. We're getting to the basket. Connect. They weren't hitting points. in there either. I mean, <laughs> right. They, they missed a lot. But look, it's a higher percentage. Yeah. And Connect yes. got some dunks. Even though Adu missed some bunnies, he continued to be aggressive. That still opens things up. And I thought they were open threes. I didn't think they were forced threes just for the sake of threes. But, but, but isn't it, like, again, they, I think Tennessee's playing to their weaknesses. I don't understand why you're setting an offense up for stand, catch, shoot. Yeah. And whenever you run that triple screen for connect to get the ball in front of the bench, you set up where either he drives into a compacted lane with a right. bunch of defenders right. there, or he kicks out to somebody else for a three. That yeah, they're open, but they ain't hit him in what four weeks at this point. So why would it's I count on that? Yeah, why would I count on that being the thing that's going to cause me to win games? We're going to take a look. At, we got some numbers. They'll show you a lot about the teams Tennessee that, that are in Tennessee's path, and it'll tell you a lot about Tennessee as well in terms of what they shoot from three. 
and how much they shoot from three. A lot of teams that shoot like they do from three don't shoot constantly from three. Right. But the whole right. game, though, has turned into one big game of horse. Uh, I wanted to see, this was before last night, I wanted to see after round one, so I went back through all 32 first-round games, and I looked at which team had the best three-point shooting percentage, and then I just wanted to look at sure, uh, pure volume. So let's not worry about how many shots you're missing and throwing away. Which team won, or what teams did when they won the three-point battle? I simply shot, I hit six, you hit three, whatever. Let's take a look at the winning uh, records of the teams in the three-point shooting. In the first 32 games of the tournament, all first round, the team that shot a higher percentage from three-point range was 26 and six, 81%. The team that actually made more baskets from three-point range, yeah, they were just 23 and nine. <laughs> so basically, the team that hits the most threes wins 70 to 80 percent of college basketball games. Which shows you how hard what Tennessee did last night was to pull yeah, off. That's yeah, true. to that's actually true. win when you can't yeah. hit. Yeah, yeah, and, and again, it was they were aided by the fact that Texas couldn't hit them either. Uh, it's funny, and we sit here. I don't know if you've noticed this, but listening to the post game last night, reading the Tennessee coverage, there's a lot of well, we didn't hit last night. We weren't hitting our shots. We weren't hitting our shots. Now our defense against Texas. Was it your defense against Texas, or was Texas just not hitting their shots? <laughs> I mean, how much of this is defense, and how much of it is what I believe, a lot of it, hot and cold? Because I watched a kid from Oakland come off the bench, hit 10 threes against Kentucky. He's got a hand in his face. He's falling out of bounds. The buzzer's sounding. So the question is, was this Texas defense slowing down your, your offense? Have you just gone cold at the wrong time of the tournament? Or was that just a bad night, and you're going to get it back the next week? Because you shot fine against St. Peter's. That's stuff we'll talk about as we keep going through today's show. Uh, when we come back, let's just keep talking about last night's game. More on the three-point stuff. We'll talk about Rick Barnes getting a win versus Texas. A lot more to come as we talk about the Vols, who are heading to Detroit for the Sweet 16. Welcome back into the Sports Source. This segment brought to you by E.G. Hines Company. Boy, they carry the absolute best in building materials. Cultured Stone, Drive It, Nudura, all of these are cutting edge materials, and they've got many, many more. Get down to A.G. Hines Company and talk to them. They've got 100 years of experience. Actually, I'm selling them short. They've got more than 100 years of experience. A.G. Hines Company, they do a tremendous job. If you've got a do-it-yourself project, or if you've got a construction company, these are the folks to call. A.G. Hines Company. All right. I want to welcome in the next member of our panel right there, Bob Hodge. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Appreciate it. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about three points and shot selection and that kind of stuff. So let's take a look here. This is Tennessee three-point range overall, and this is through last night. From three, they're shooting 33.9% on the season, all right? Now, this just goes to the Mississippi State game, the bottom stats here, but broke it down. They're shooting 40% in transition. Of course, you don't get as many of those, but when they do the pull-up three in transition, it's 40%, which means when they get into their half court, it's under 33%. That's not good. And then in the last 10 seconds of the shot clock, it's under 30%. It's under 28%. They're shooting 27.9. Now, that's not highly unusual. So let's take a look at the last 10 seconds on the shot clock all year in the SEC. Look over there on the right. There's your three-point shots. Kentucky hit 37% in the at the end of the, the shot clock. South Carolina, 34. Tennessee's ninth, 27.9 when they get down under 10 seconds. But look at that column over there on the left. Tennessee is the best in the league, more than 50%, when they can get it inside with less than 10 seconds on the clock. They're the best. So my question, would, that would tell me, hey, when the clock's running late, let's get it inside instead of firing up another three. I just thought those were interesting numbers. Uh, Vince, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about covering, uh, carrying over from the last segment? Could be this, could be Rick Barnes, anything. Well, I, I think I think Ganey's minutes were important uh, yesterday as well, um, just defensively and just being a pest and effort plays as well. Uh, it was interesting that Meshack was on the floor to close out the game and not Vescovy. Um, he, he brings tremendous uh, energy and just loved his defense. And Ziegler, even though he didn't have a big game, man, he was impactful. He was able to get in the paint. He was able to bother Texas. All those turnovers for Texas. Ziegler had a part in that. They got nervous because he was up in their grill and under their chin. And um, I, I, I thought there were, it was a team effort to overcome their shooting issues. And in the NCAA tournament, sometimes you need that kind of performance where you're not – sometimes your star needs to carry you, but then other times everybody else needs to contribute. I thought that happened. Jeff, we were talking here in the break. You had a point about uh, Tobey Awaku. Played well last night, but he, he had a couple of 
uh, brain-related mistakes. <laughs> yeah, he only played 11 minutes. They were impactful. Uh, yeah. Tobey Awok is the kind of guy this time of year every team wants. He's going to come in off the bench. He's going to play hard. He's physical. He's not going to be pushed around. As soon as he came in, too, right yeah. off the bat when they needed him early when they weren't hitting anything. Yeah, the minutes early from Ganey and Awok I thought were impactful yeah. off the bench. But he had fouls that cost him more opportunity on the floor. And we'll get into Creighton later. But they have a seven-footer. It's going to be uh, it's going to be a fight around the post uh, around the basket again for the ball. Those kinds of mistakes keep him from being on the floor. And a walk, I think, is really important for what Tennessee needs. Uh, he's hitting free throws. He can make plays offensively around the basket as well. So Tennessee needs Tobey Awaka. So avoiding fouls, which has been a problem for him. And I know that that also probably comes with the way that he plays as aggressive as he is. But avoiding those mistakes this week, I think, will be important. Well, he had the two early ones, and then you had the third one where he was not in the position, and the fourth one, which, yeah. Yeah, kind of, kind of just threw the guy on the, on the fourth foul. And the yeah. third foul on the TV broadcast, Jim Jackson, I yeah. think, accurately pointed out, hey, you don't have position here. You're boxed out. Don't go over the top. Yeah. Save that one for the, for the next time down. Yeah. The one right. positive thing we haven't talked about, this team is resilient. Like, they, they blew the lead, and they – they stuck with it, and they yeah. won the game. They shot about as poorly as you humanly can, yeah. and they stuck with it, and they kept coming at, at Texas. I think that there's a, there's a lot of sense of urgency in what Tennessee's doing these last two games that has to continue very specifically because of the type of team that Creighton is. And, and so I, I will say as horribly as they're shooting, I think they play to their weaknesses at times. Yeah. But this team, that's a veteran team, and you can tell those are like young men not boys that are out there playing in the half court for Tennessee right now. Well, I got a little nervous there at the end. I thought, okay, they may blow this thing. But at no point did I feel in that entire game that I ever feel that Tennessee wasn't the team on the front foot. They were the one taking it to Texas. Even when Texas was making their run, even when Tennessee couldn't hit a thing, they were the ones, you know, you'd ring the bell to start the uh, the next round, they were out of that corner before Texas was. It was yeah. the feeling I had all night. Uh, Bob, thoughts on last night? Any takeaways? You want to talk Rick Barnes? Anything? I, I, I thought the, the kind of hidden stat in that game was Tennessee, 14 offensive rebounds to seven for yeah. Texas. Now, what were you doing? Hey, we missed a shot, we get a rebound, we get to miss another <laughs> shot. Yeah, that's true. Fantastic. <laughs> but if you don't have those 14 rebounds, that's let's say it was even. Okay, yeah. that's more possessions for Texas in a game where in that last 10 minutes, every possession – became its own little world because they just kept whittling away, whittling away. And I think that goes to something about Tennessee's resilience. Okay, we're not shooting. We're not hitting anything. It's awful. I mean, me and you were texted at one time. They were 1 of 21 at that point in threes. Okay, you really can't get worse. Yeah, Yeah, you could be 0 of 22. But the fact that they kept going to the offensive boards, I thought that was a big difference, if nothing else. You were taking possessions away from Texas. You also wound up with 10 more shots on the night, which yeah. made the difference in a four-point win. And there were two of their last four from three, and they won by four. So, I mean, and those were open, available, clutch threes, and yeah. it just shows their confidence. But uh, I still th- think they did a good job of, for the most part, getting inside. And their defense led to some offense for them as well. This team is best when that happens also. Uh, I just we don't, We're kind of out of time here, but I did want to say congratulations to Rick Barnes to go and beat Texas, as I mentioned off the top. But also, okay. uh, you know, the facts are the facts. We showed you the facts last week. He's not had a great tournament history, but he has made it to back-to-back Sweet 16. So on yep. the second time, Tennessee's only made 10. Yeah. He's, in, he's made three of them. Uh, this is the, only the second time in school history I believe you've done it twice. Uh, so, you know, you could – Maybe we should just look at the last three years. Two Sweet 16s and an SEC tournament title. Rick Barnes yeah. has figured this tournament thing out. Uh, but anyway, kudos to him. And, and after the game, in case you didn't see it, read it, hear it, he was exactly what you'd expect. He was classy about Texas. He was classy about the other coaches over there who were, of course, assistants to him. He was classy about his former players at Texas. We said it last week. His numbers are very, very comparable in the NCAA tournament to Bob Huggins. But he's the nice Bob Huggins. He's the good Bob Huggins. Yeah. Sober That's the Bob reason Huggins. you want him. He is an ambassador for your school. Yeah. What are you going to say? Uh, sober Bob Huggins. He's also okay. there <laughs> without a turtleneck. And on that note, uh, <laughs> I do want to say, Tennessee not only going for their second Elite Eight, they're trying to make some more history in Michigan this week. I went back through the media guide, and as best I could tell, if we could I keep pointing. There we go. Tennessee's never won in the state of Michigan. 
Oh. 0-4 in Ann Arbor, 0-2 in East Lansing, 0-1 under Bruce Pearl when they went to Oakland, 0-1 many years ago when they played Detroit University, which is now Detroit Mercy, who's hosting. They're the host team and Oakland. They, they combine host this, this regional. And then Wayne State, who is the College of Detroit. So, uh, and that should be 0-1 at Wayne State. So I think they're 0-9 all time in Michigan. So that's, they're going to have to get off the schneid in the Great Lakes State. When we come back, let's start looking at the remaining teams in the Midwest region, how Tennessee stacks up. Uh, get your pencils out just to tell you what kind of style of play they like, who's bigger, who's smaller, who's fast, etc. Hopefully it'll be a little fun. We got visuals. Coming back on the Sports Source. Welcome back to the Sports Source. This segment brought to you by Parkside Cabin Rentals. For the best place to stay in the Smokies this spring, this summer, this fall, or heck, if you want to plan ahead for next winter, ParksideCabinRentals.com will let you do it. You can go right there and check out all of their floor plans, descriptions, photos. You can look at the maps, know exactly where you're going to be. And whenever you stay with Parkside Cabin Rentals, whether you are near Gatlinburg or whether you're way back in, in the Smokies, when you go into the city, it's free parking. Parkside Cabin Rentals, the Ogles, the Ogle family, they've been doing this since the National Park became a national park. They know what they're doing. Parkside Cabin Rentals. Okay, let's uh, go ahead and get you involved. Get your smartphones out, or you can go to my website, sportsource.tv. We've got a poll question for you, and today's poll question is, how do you feel about UT's Final Four chances now? And I'll give you three choices. One, this is the year. Two, I'm still nervous. Three, they'll blow it. It's the Randy Quaid from Major League Two role. Uh, you can vote right now. It looks like uh, there are very few on the loop. You, they'll blow it line. So go ahead, use your smartphone, click the QR code, and it allows you to vote. We want you to play along here. This stuff always fascinates me. I love seeing the percentages. And as you play along, you can see the percentages move. Of course, once we get over a few hundred votes, it doesn't move as much, but... Keep going and, and voting there and uh, let us know what you think. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, next couple of segments, I just want to give you a visual breakdown, and we'll explain this for you. Visual breakdown of where Tennessee stands. We did this last year. Versus the other four remaining teams in the Midwest, and those are Gonzaga, Purdue, and Utah State. One of those will go today, Purdue and Utah State. Creighton is awaiting you already. They're up next. So let's take a look at big picture stuff next. Scouting report here, big picture. Uh, the On the left... It's the offensive rating. That's CBB Analytics. That's not Ken Palm. That's their offensive rating. Purdue and Gonzaga by far the best. You see Tennessee. Here's the thing. Tennessee's had a good, efficient offense all year. They've ranked highly. Mm -hmm. Problem is you got three much better offenses in there. So now Utah State isn't there, but I don't think Utah State's going to be in Detroit. Um, Vince, your thoughts on the fact that this is a good offense, but of the four teams that are probably going to be there in Detroit, it's the worst of them. Yeah, and you've had the stat that uh, out of the last 10 national champions, nine of them have been in the top 10 in offensive efficiency. So this tells you that those are the teams that have that characteristic to win it all. Because now it's beyond just getting advancing into the Sweet 16. Now you want to know, can they go all the way? And um, there, there's some better candidates in that, in, statistically in that group. Will, you had a point? Yeah, well, it's, it's also three of the best teams in the half court in all of college basketball. That's part of it as well. Yeah. Gonzaga, over the last month and a half, has probably been the hottest shooting team, one of the hottest shooting teams in the history of college basketball, especially beyond the arc. Creighton's fantastically efficient in the half they court. They started really cold last night, but yeah, heated up as the game they went did. on. And they yeah. ended up going 53%. Gonzaga yeah. did from beyond the arc. Creighton ended up hitting yeah. almost 50, or 50% just under that. Purdue and throws the ball into Zach Eady, and nobody knows how to defend him or thing. officiate him They're, right now. That's true. They can also shoot it from three, though. They They're good. They got an inside-out game. So these are well-rounded offenses mm -hmm. Tennessee's going to face. So your hope, and I'm, I'm afraid, it would be nice if Tennessee can run with somebody. It would be more entertaining to watch. But my fear is you're going to have to grind games out again. So let's take a look. at. The, let's go back to that same chart if we could. I'm sorry. Let's go back to that last chart if we could. There we go. Uh, the middle chart there. That's defense, and the lower, the better, all right? Lower, the better. Tennessee, the best defense in that group. Mm -hmm. And Utah State, no surprise, they're the worst defense. But just as you are about just as far behind in offense, you are that far ahead in defense. I, 
I mean, I guess I should feel good about that. The problem is I would feel better about that 10 years ago before the game turned into a three-point shooting contest, and it's gone all offense. Well, don't we usually see the teams that try to win and coaches that try to hang their hat on defense go home early? Rick yeah. Barnes usually goes home early. Kelvin Sampson, yeah. Tony Bennett. Like, I, I just don't know that defense wins championships right now. And then if you look pace, this is the interesting thing. The fastest team of these remaining, Tennessee. Tennessee's the fastest pace, creating the slowest pace. That is a big difference from the last few years. Oh, yes. Big difference from Tennessee's previous five years. But I wonder if, you know, has it shifted now that – we were talking in between breaks. It looks like if they don't hit their shots early, they slow it down. Yeah. And I just wonder if that's Barnes going back to what he knows. Because he was very happy. He talked about it last night how much he liked that, that style of victory. Uh, let's take a look at the next one. Now let's just look at scoring, where these teams get their points. I'll do this kind of quickly. Just points per game, points per 40 minutes. And these are all by 40 minutes. But that first chart, upper left, that's Gonzaga's got the best. They score the most. Purdue scores the next most. Then Tennessee, just ahead of Creighton in terms of points per 40 minutes. In terms of paint points, Tennessee down toward the bottom, but so is Creighton. So it's Gonzaga, Utah State, and Purdue. It's that paint points thing is surprising that Purdue is only third. Yeah. There, but that talks to they, they shoot some threes. Second chance points. Tennessee right in the middle. Purdue, of course, it makes sense with Zach Eady. They're going to get a lot of putbacks. Bench minute, uh, bench points for 40 minutes. Tennessee tops. Tennessee tops at bench points. So you're going to need the Iwakas or the Gainies to come in and get you some points. Uh, fast break points. Tennessee way up there. They're, they're second only to Gonzaga and fast break points. Points off turnover. They're the best ones, and we already talked about it. They, that's kind of how they won last they night. mattered last night in a big way. Points off turnovers is one where Tennessee has an advantage. The, the big thing that stands out to me, the bench points. I mean, because we've talked about is Tennessee right. deep enough? With, have they used Iwaka enough? Have they, did they need to use Mayshack more? And Tennessee, of the teams that are left in the division, are in the region, have the, the most bench points per game. And who you're going to face in Creighton, we also worry that sometimes Rick Barnes wears his team out. Creighton goes, they got some veteran guys that will show you the next segment. Those guys play 40 minutes a game no. the same way that Ziegler did. They're going to yep. be worn out. Yeah, they uh, had some 50-minute showings last night. Yeah, they yeah. did. So uh, that may be one where it's bench versus bench. Uh, anything else on the, the, the scoring points there? Yeah, you need uh, that, that defense that seems to be much better than everybody else. They need that to lead offense. It happened last night, and you're going to need that moving forward because – at, at times, it does get chaotic in the, t in the tournament, and obviously you have some really efficient offenses to go against. Well, let's talk about efficiency here. Let's look at the three-point shooting very quickly. We're, we're getting behind. But uh, effective field goal percentage, Tennessee dead last. Oof. Now, what that does is that takes into account that a three is worth more than a two. So that's not just field goal percentage. It is weighted to show threes count more than two, and you are dead last. Three-point attempts differential, you are second meaning you take a lot of them. Creighton takes more. Three-point attempts per 40 minutes. There you see Creighton is the most. Tennessee next, then Purdue, Gonzaga, Utah State. Three-point percentage, Purdue, best. You're fourth. So let me, let me just make this clear again. In terms of attempts per 40 minutes, you take the second most. In terms of your ability to hit them, you're fourth ahead of only Utah State. Now, whether that's efficient, I, well, I think you can go back to effective field goal percentage and it'll tell you. <laughs> Assists per 40 minutes, Purdue way up there. I think that's a lot of dumping it down to Edie. And then Tennessee second. But mm -hmm. there's your shooting. It does make you question. I mean, that's one. When this thing ends, I think we're going to be sitting there going, why'd you shoot, why'd you shoot so much from outside? Yeah. Why didn't you work it inside? I think some, some of that is personnel. They, they don't have, they're not deep in terms of options to score in the post. Yeah. If it's either a do or it's nobody, right? I mean, a walk could give them some walk second some. chance. Yeah. Right. But it's mainly a do, like mm -hmm. where some other teams may have more options inside. They got to get those paint points in penetrating in other ways other than and just throw do. down on the post. Aside it's, from connecting Ziegler, you don't have a lot of guys who right. do the Well, ball screens, right? That's why you quick. have to have the pick and roll and you have to have the ball screens so that you can get guys moving towards the basket so you can have those points in the paint because you don't really have a back-to-the-basket presence right now. Tennessee doesn't and when it comes to the half-court offense. I still think I'd work out a, a do more. We've shown you the numbers the last couple of weeks, too. When he's up, they win. Yeah. When he's Ziegler down, they connect. lose. Ball screen action with Adu has been very effective at times. They, yeah. they ranked a lot higher in effective offensive rating early in the season, yeah. I think, when they had more than that. I agree. They yeah. talked about that after the game. Did you see Jay Wright and Candace Parker speaking about that in the postgame after Oregon and Creighton last night? They talked about pick and roll with Adu and connect, and they looked at what Gonzaga did against – I mean, what Creighton did against Oregon. They thought maybe this is something that can work for Tennessee's advantage. 
We're miles over. When we come <laughs> back, we're going to continue this. We'll also take a look at Creighton. We'll start telling you about their personnel. Much more to come in the Sports Source as we get you ready for Tennessee's Sweet 16 run. Come on back. Welcome back. This segment brought to you by Southeast Termite and Pest Control. Folks, it won't be long until you're hearing mosquitoes and you're scratching their bites and you're smacking them on your skin, hoping to kill the little devils. Unless you call Southeast Termite and Pest Control about their new mosquito treatment. If you do that, you're going to be, dealt with, you're going to be dealing with a ton of mosquitoes. It's more effective for you and it's less impactful on the good insects in your yard. Bees and butterflies, they're happily uh, moving around. They're not noticing this stuff that's killing the mosquitoes. Southeast Termite and Pest Control, get in touch with them this week. Tell them we told you to call. Uh, I use them. You'll be happy if you do too. All right, back with Chuck, Bob, and Vince. We're behind, so we need to roll through this. So we're gonna get you involved. We're gonna show you more about the teams that are involved here in the Midwest. And then we are going to show you a little bit more about Creighton and we'll discuss it on the backside of some of this stuff. So let's take a look at turnovers. Like we said, we, Tennessee won that game last night with turnovers. Steals per 40 minutes is on the left there. Tennessee, by far, they're number one. You want to be high there? They are. They're the highest. In terms of turnovers per 40 minutes, that's your offense giving it away. You want to be low. And Tennessee is low. That's good. Purdue turns it over. Utah State turns it over. Creighton turns it over a little bit more than you. Gonzaga takes care of it better than you. Turnover differential, again, you want to be low. Now, here's a positive. Look at this, Creighton. Creighton's the worst at that statistic in terms of turnover differential. Again, came up big last night as Tennessee won the points off turnovers 15 to five, got themselves some extra possessions. Certainly would help if they really do play like the best in this category and Creighton does play like the worst when they meet on Friday. Let's take a look at size. That's next. And I, we're talking blocks, we're talking rebounds. I know that's not pure size, but best way to do it here. Rebounds per 40 minutes, you wanna be high. You're second only to Purdue of the remaining teams. Offensive rebounds per 40 minutes. You're second only to Purdue. You get, Bob mentioned it earlier, 14 offensive rebounds last night. Defensive rebounds, Creighton leads the way. Tennessee, fourth. So that's one to be wary of. Do you have an advantage on the offensive glass? Do they have too big of an advantage on the defensive glass? Rebounding differential. Well, no surprise, Purdue runs away with that one. Creighton a little bit ahead of Tennessee. You're only ahead of Utah State. So that rebounding thing, one to watch. Blocks per 40 minutes, that's congratulations to Adu there, man. He's winning it. Mm -hmm. uh, interestingly, Zach Eady, the bottom of that list. That is interesting. Uh, that's all right, in terms right of there. the per 40 minutes. Yeah. All right, let's take a look now at fouls, another place you won the game last night. Typically, we've talked about it, Tennessee hasn't gotten to the foul uh, stripe a lot. Personal fouls per 40 minutes, you are called more than anybody else. So could you find yourself in foul trouble? It's happened a lot this year. Defensive personal fouls, you get called for more. This goes back to not having a lot of drivers on this team, but offensive personal fouls, you're really low on that list. So is Creighton. Uh, in terms of uh, the, um, let's see, PFDs, I'm trying, oh, that's a foul differential. You're right in the middle. And then free throw percentage, Creighton is aces, you are second best. So if it comes down to free throws, Creighton's got a slight advantage there. All right. And I want to show you some stuff about just Creighton in general. Let's go ahead and go to the tail of the tape. You can just compare those two side by side. In terms of uh, offensive rating, Creighton's a little better. Defensive rating, Creighton's a little better. Pace of play, Tennessee likes to play a little faster. Effective field goal percentage, Creighton 57.7%. That green 99 means they are in the 99th percentile. They're as good as anybody in the country in effective field goal percentage whereas you're about 68th percentile. That is a big one to watch. They shoot it better than you. Offensive rebounding percentage, you're better. Turnover percentage, as we just showed you, you're better. Free throw attempt rate, you're a little better than them in terms of how many times you get up there. Let's look at the next slide. There's this just shot chart for the entire season. Creighton's on the left. They get it inside, they hit it. All those reds are good. The blues on Tennessee side over on the right, that's not good. Blues are misses, reds are hits. They hit from the three-point range straight up ahead of the uh, top of the key, and they get it inside and they score it. And then the final thing here, let's take a look at their key players. Trey Alexander, Baylor Shireman, who is really good. Uh, Ryan Kalkbrenner, who is their seven-footer. Those guys average 17 and a half, 18 and a half, 17 and a half points, and they've also got Stephen Ashworth, 10 and a half points. Three seniors, a junior, they play a lot of minutes. They aren't, this is one thing where you're not going to have the experience slash leadership 
right. exactly. uh, arrow pointing in your direction. Creighton, we showed it earlier. Josh and I were talking off air. Tennessee, 26 all-time trips. Creighton, 25. Neither team to a Final Four. They're at the top of the list, basically, nationally in terms of the most trips without a Final Four. You wouldn't think about it. Programs are kind of similar, and they're built mm -hmm. kind of similarly in terms of their, their veteran leadership this year. Thoughts on this matchup with Creighton? I would have preferred Oregon. Exactly. Your yeah. thoughts? That's what I think we were kind of – a lot of people were hoping for last night. Let's, Creighton is one of the best basketball teams. I think a lot of people don't automatically associate with that. They've been to now three of the uh, last four Sweet 16s. Region final last year, they lost by one point to San Diego State. This is a veteran team on a mission, and you're going to have to beat them because they play inside out. They score inside yeah. and shooting it. Think of Reed Shepard. they got a kid that can hit it kind of like Reed Shepard. I think if you dig through all those numbers, Tennessee turning the other team over and getting points off of it, Creighton looks like they're a little bit better than you at just about everything else offensively, so does that become the key? Not necessarily your defense will shut Creighton down and they're only going to score 60 points, but do your, does your defense take advantage of some turnovers and you get points off of it that way? Well, you know my thought. Some of them. We know my thought. We just did all that numbers for the basketball. Good. And it's for me. <laughs> for me, it's just who shoots more? Who hits more yeah, threes? Yeah. So we looked at all that. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> Whoever hits more threes wins. Vince. A couple things real quick. They had four guys. You mentioned how prolific they were at, with all the minutes that their, their players give you. Uh, four guys, 18 points or more in their win over Oregon, and they were impressive. That's one. And then Chuck mentioned it, the brand. Don't be for, – for the football fans that are joining in on this basketball run, exactly. don't be lured in by the name of the school that is yeah. not at a Power 5 football conference. They will not be afraid. They never are afraid. Uh, of the moment. And I think that's – that's. Uh, and didn't they get uh, UConn their worst loss of the season? Last yeah. night, uh, Creighton hit 15 threes. Even though it was double overtime, start the second overtime on a 15-0 run. This team can play. Well, I mean, I think Tennessee fans remember when Butler was at their, at their best because they, they gave you an overtime game in the tournament. Butler, we all know Gonzaga. Yeah. Creighton's that level of mid-major. You know, they, they mm -hmm. are mid-major – only in name because the Big East, Big East Conference is pretty darn good. Uh, it would be major if they played football. But you look at Creighton, Butler, Gonzaga, that's the way people should be looking at this. This is a dangerous program that's been there before, many times before. And uh, you guys mentioned maybe it would have been better Oregon. How many times has Tennessee lost – to teams that had much worse seeds than them. You've outlined it. Yeah. Yeah. Davis talked about it. So maybe them playing the higher seed has their attention more and there's not a little bit of that left. Well, real quick, after Tennessee's win last night, did they do the classic NCAA tournament celebration in the locker room? No. A lot of them went in there and started watching Creighton and Oregon on TV. That's probably because they broke the uh, the backboard, the the, the bracket. Colin after, Coyne, after, Saint, yeah. after Saint Peter's <laughs> smacked it, broke the bracket. They don't have a bracket to celebrate. All right. When we come back, more on Tennessee's offense and some interesting numbers about teams and their scoring droughts. We'll talk about Dalton Connect. What's happened? Have teams just focused on him? Is he gone cold? Is he getting tired? What's up? Come on back on the Sports Source. Welcome back into the Sports Source. This segment brought to you by Madisonville Marine. Boat show deals and specials and rebates and extended warranties. All still going on. you got a week to get down there. March 31st is when all those deals end. There's no better place to buy a boat because they've got a just unbelievable, supreme selection. Every kind of boat you can imagine. All on one lot. Go see for yourself. Highway 411 North in Madisonville or visit them, madmarine.com. All right, let's remind you of the poll. See how that's doing. If we've got that, it uh, looks like... People are still nervous. That leads. <laughs> and there's a few more people saying this is the year than there are people saying they'll blow it. But for the most part, I know I shouldn't have put the I'm still nervous thing there. Never give anybody <laughs> no. the middle out. <laughs> Never do that. It's my mistake. All right. Uh, thank you. Keep playing. Keep giving us your answers. Uh, Tennessee's last six games, they have shot 36, 35, 37, 30, 50 percent versus St. Peter's and 33 percent from the floor against Texas. Not good. They've been even worse from three. That's overall. Dalton Connect has made 17 of 50 buckets in his last three games from the field, 17 shots. That's his worst three-game output since the turn of the year. Question, is that because teams are wearing him, he's wearing down, or is it because teams are simply focusing on him more, realizing finally they got no other drivers? Squish him. I, I think it's Barnes. I think what Barnes has done is, has caused him to run through screens, catch the ball on the, on the sideline, 
and he's stopped. He's stationary. He has the ball in his hands. When Tennessee, Jim Jackson said it last night, right? When Tennessee's using some type of ball screen or pick and roll to get him moving when he catches the basketball or get the ball in his hands with him moving, he's great. But I think too often Tennessee's causing him to become stationary when he gets the ball and then it's either contested three or he drives into three oh, defenders. The three hit last night. He was on the move. Yeah. He got it to him on the edge and he was on the run. Thoughts on Dalton Connects and what's up? Yeah, I don't, I don't or is think. It, it's a three-game span. Am I making too much out of it? We'll find out here in five days maybe because I, 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 don't, I don't think that he's wearing down. Uh, I mean, I still see the lift when he's around the basket. Like wearing down, we're thinking legs. Does he have yeah. them, right? Uh, the shot that he made from behind the three-point line was a tough shot. He hit it. Um, so I think he's probably in tough positions. He might be forcing a little bit. I mean, th- there's more pressure mm-hmm. on the shots that he's taking, yeah. considering the stakes, and he's not hitting them as easily. But I think getting him in better positions to have better shots yeah. would be part of the goal. But he, you know, he, he missed what would seem like a gimme shot pretty close to the basket on a, a two-pointer. just didn't go. So uh, I, I do wonder, is there a little bit of forced action on his side? I would, I would think if he was wearing down, it would show up if he's not getting any rebounds and that sort of thing. He's not playing his defense is going away, too, so I don't think it's so much wearing down. I, it, it could go back to what Will says that, okay, you've put him in a bad position offensively and he's not been able to take advantage of some things that uh, he was before. But I don't see the wearing down part of it as much as I will go with something else. Yeah, I wonder – I also wonder how much opposing coaches have finally figured out. Right. Yeah. Okay, it took us 30 games, but here's what Tennessee's got. Stop him, and we stop a lot of it. Well, I mean, here's another thing, too, guys. This is his first time going through something like this, right? He's it's never lovely. had a season like this. And all the game plans, you're going, to start, you're going to stop him. That's what you're going to stop. A couple of the misses were back of the rim. If you're wearing down, you pretend to come up short, right? I mean, those look like they're in all the way. So, I mean, I, and I, I think there's also a lot of standing around. And who else is going to get open? Or If he does have a chance to pass, it's like oh, there's just too much standing around. Is Viscovi going to hit it? Probably not. James came through with some, and then it comes down to Ziegler. So, if, if DK doesn't do it, you really have a mixed bag of who might be able to. Uh, we actually caught up in this segment. <laughs> so, that's a good thing. I, I, in between segments, I told my director I was going to take something out. Now I'm going to see if we can put something back in. Don't do it yet. Okay, well, go ahead and do it. Uh, here's, here's, here's what we do. Uh, I wanted, there's a lot of talk about Tennessee and their scoring droughts, and we've talked on this show before, and I've always wondered, is it something that happens elsewhere too? So I got with the folks at CBB Analytics, and they deliver these to NBA teams, to colleges, and we pay for them here in the sports source. And that, what they did was you really can't track droughts. What you can trout is how many times you've, gone on a long, you've allowed somebody to go on a long scoring run. That kind of tells you what a drought. You're on a drought when the other team goes for 10 plus or 15 plus points. So I looked at. They sent me the numbers for every game all season for every team in the country. Wow. 360 teams. I just looked at the SEC teams, and what you find there is Tennessee really having more droughts than anybody else. Uh, no, they're having fewer droughts than anybody um, else. Believable. Fewer droughts than anybody else. So that's something we all pick on the fact that they uh, they, they go on these long scoring droughts. When you look around the country, it's just we watch Tennessee more closely and right. it sticks out to us. The reality is only six times all year in the regular season did they give up a run of 10-plus points in a game. Auburn, six as well, you played a much tougher schedule right. than Auburn. Yeah. And only one time all year did you give up and, a run of 15 And here's points. one thing I've started watching, too. Tennessee may be on a scoring drought. But the other team, maybe. Yes. That's yeah. the key is the I defense, mean, that's I think, I, is yeah. good enough. When you have those two-minute, yeah. four-minute droughts, your defense is good enough that you don't have to you're, – you're not 8-0 run, 10-0 run, 12-0 run. Exactly. Exactly. So. All right. Uh, anybody else? Anything else on that? No, I just okay. – I'm, I'm actually shocked by that because I have been Mr. Drought. <laughs> I, I, just, I just think that that is Tennessee's biggest problem. And boy, have I been wrong. <laughs> well, I put up a graphic last year showing how they have droughts. And, well, if you do the research and look everywhere, they all have droughts. And this year, Tennessee has fewer big, long droughts than anybody yeah. else. All right. When we come back, let's talk about the SEC's overall flop. Who had the worst week? Greg Sankey, <laughs> Bruce Pearl, or John Calipari? We've got a segment coming up for our Kentucky fans who watch from Harlan County, Bell County, and Greer County? Whitley County? Some of you are watching in Kentucky. I forget the county. My apologies. We'll come back. We'll talk Calipari, Pearl, Sankey. Next.
Welcome back to the Sports Source. This segment brought to you by Daniel Hood Roofing. Before you ever see a water stain on your ceiling, your roof could be leaking. In fact, your roof could be helping to hide the damage. The only, one, the only way to find out is to have somebody get up on your roof and take a look. And here's the thing about Daniel Hood Roofing. They're not just going to go up there and come down and say, oh, yeah, you got a real problem up there. They've got cameras. They've got drones. They've got tools that actually show you the amount of moisture that goes into that's, in, that's being retained in those shingles. They can show you all that. And not to mention the fact they're not going to come down and tell you there's a problem if there's not a problem. I'll vouch for Daniel on that front. DanielHoodRoofing.com. Check out all the positive testimonials at their website. You'll be happy if you give these guys a call and let them do your roof. Okay, Greg Sankey got a lot of grief this week because he has been pushing to expand the NCAA tournament so that big conferences <laughs> get more bids. They're more deserving than the little guys like, say, Yale and Oakland. Uh, the problem is <laughs> Yale and Oakland then beat Auburn and Kentucky this week, <laughs> and all of America, including myself, who doesn't want the tournament to expand, and I'm okay if the little guy still has a, a crust of bread occasionally, <laughs> we're all laughing at Greg Sankey having to eat that pie right in his face. But did he have the worst week this week? Bob, I'm going to start with you. Greg Sankey took it on the chin as the SEC went 3-5 and five in their first round with two of their... their Crown jewels losing to the very teams he says aren't as deserving. Mm -hmm. Bruce Pearl, well, he just lost another upset. He's been at Auburn for 10 years. He's been to six tournaments, three exits in the second round, two in the first round. He had the incredible Final Four run. Right. And then he also had one year where he wasn't even yeah. eligible. So Pearl not doing a, a – he won the SEC tournament, but as we learned a couple of years ago, no one cares. Uh, then you got John Calipari. Speaking of which. <laughs> then you got John Calipari, who lost again early. His last four or five years in the tournament have been bad. But he keeps coming out and saying, yeah, but look at all the – we're playing all these young kids. We're getting them to the NBA. Right. I'm like, are they paying you for that? I thought they were paying yeah, you to win yeah. in Kentucky. I don't think they're running a daycare center. So, Bob, I ask you, who had the worst week? week worst right. week? Sankey, Pearl, Calipari. You know, I would like to go with Sankey simply because he keeps showing up in just about every story I'm reading about the tournament. There's a, a Greg Sankey reference, but it had to be John Calipari. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, Kentucky is just a different world when it comes to their basketball expectations. And, one, people wouldn't have liked it if they had lost to Gonzaga or Kansas or North Carolina. Yeah. But to lose to Oakland – and then Two years of, after you lose to St. Peter's. And, right. and a lot of fans are sitting there going, well, they came all the way from the Bay Area. And yeah. No, <laughs> it wasn't even that open. So, so yeah. I think it was Calipari because a lot of people now are saying the only thing keeping you here after this year is a $33 million buyout. I don't know if that's true. I think he. I thought he improved that team. Kentucky's got the money to pay that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, okay. I, I think so. But I thought he got the team better. But yeah, in the end, you're what in the in the past five years, you've won two tournament games yeah. of all types. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's just who's, who's the loser I, of the week. I think it's Calipari. I mean, and even in his post game, he's talking about rethinking his approach and playing freshmen that are 18 and 19 years old against 24 and 25 year old players. Like maybe I'm not doing it the right way. And then you brought up the financial thing, John. He's talking about we help so many kids and their families financially. Well, he's been helped pretty good financially, too. But, I mean, at Kentucky, two years out of three, to lose to St. Peter's and then to lose like you did, no, I think that's the big loser. And you're hearing more and more Kentucky fans saying, give us Bruce Pearl. They'd love to have Bruce Pearl. <laughs> because they would have much rather lost to somebody else. Yeah, it would be better to lose to Yale. <laughs> All right, Josh, who's the bigger loser? Yeah, um, my initial reaction would be Cal because he's there to win national titles. They're not close to competing for him based on the, the results. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to say him, though, because we should all be so lucky to have people debate, should somebody pay me $33 million to not work? I'm going to go Sankey because I just thought what he said was obviously wrong and was going to be made fun of no matter the results of the tournament. But then to have the results go right back into your face immediately right. – and Greg Sankey is a guy that he is supposed to be helping lead the charge to what the future is of college athletics. Yeah. And now he has a lot of people rallying against him in his role of whatever the future of college sports will be. Well, and the whole push for the 14 teams and the automatic bids right. and the SEC, it, yeah. that got shot down really quick when it came yeah. out. So he's, he's not exactly – he also was for the nine-game schedule, and his own president said no. So he's not exactly on a win streak right now, aside from 
cash, right. which is the <laughs> ultimate winner, I guess. Vince, very quickly, who's the loser of the week? Yeah, and to to uh, to the Calipari thing, uh, well, to the SEC thing. I think that now we're going to hear coaches say, "Well, you know, we're we're beating each other, and like yeah, we're exactly. you know, we, it's too difficult to get yeah. through." So, what can we do to find a way to have postseason success? I, I do think it's Calipari, and his explanation of it, I thought, was completely inaccurate. Oh, this got this got old on us all of a sudden. All of a sudden. No, we've been trending this way. You, yeah, you, you haven't know, been a winner since COVID. Right. <laughs> our, our guys are, you know, 18, 19. Everybody else has an average age of like 24, 25. No, they don't. They have some older players. Exactly. Not average right. It's still exactly. by his choice. Right. It's right. still by his choice. And he said, well, he, should I change? Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah you should. Yeah. I think it's Calipari because nobody can get rid of Greg Sankey. <laughs> Nobody's talking. Nobody at Auburn's talking about getting rid of Bruce Pearl. They are talking about it. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know. It mm-hmm. may be murmurs, but it's being talked about. All exactly. right. When, when we come back, spring practice. Well, basketball's doing well when we got spring practice relegated <laughs> this low. Spring practice underway. One coach is expecting big things from the defensive line. We'll talk about Tim Banks next. Come on back. Welcome back to the Sports Source. Folks, if you need a security system, if you need a home entertainment system, if you need your home automated, with uh, basically so you can run your whole home, lights, locks, doors, everything from a push of a tablet or cell phone button, smartphone button, safety systems. Those are the folks to call. They've been doing it for more than 20 years. People use them all over East Tennessee. Just do yourself a favor. Notice how many times you see that logo right there against a white background. It's stuck in windows of businesses. It's on signs in yards. You see it all over the place. Why? They do a good job. SafetySystems.com. Get in touch with VFL J.J. Serlis and his team this week. Okay, one more reminder of the poll. We'll give you the results in the next segment, but let's go ahead and put it up there. Eh, it's still in the middle. I never should have done that. Come on. <laughs> There's nobody, there are no negative people out there thinking they're going to blow this. They're not. Come on. And there's no more of you than that that are going to say, this is the year. <laughs> That's my fault. I never should have given you the middle ground. All right, at least I guess you're being honest. Uh, Heck of a statement this week from Tennessee defensive coordinator Tim Banks. Let's go ahead and take a listen to it. How nice is it to have a veteran like Amari Thomas on that interior defensive line? And then what do you expect from that group this spring? Yeah, you know, again, I think we, we, we should really have the best defensive line in the country. You know, I feel really good about our depth that we're building. Um, I feel really strongly about, you know, their attitude and the determination that those guys have played with. You know, and again, I'm not even talking as much about football, just great guys. You know, they're great human beings and – you know, they've really worked hard. And, you know, as coaches, we want to see guys develop and reach their full potential, you know, and being able to see these guys, you know, go from year one to where they are right now, you know, has been huge. And, you know, we're super excited about those guys. I'm not big on the smoky grape. That hat looks good. Um, <laughs> all right. Best defensive line in the country. Did he catch himself there in the middle and realize what he said? And he's like, I'm just talking, you know, these are great guys. I'm yeah. not even talking about the football thing. He said the football thing. He was pretty clear about the depth and the ad- Vince, best defensive line in the country. You surprised by that comment? He did say should. I would underline that. Uh, I, I do think he maybe caught himself and reeled it back a little bit. And then Ronnie Garner was asked about that. He said, I didn't know he said that. Uh, <laughs> Pressure. He said, uh, I, w- I would have to, uh, I would love the, to be able to ordain these guys to be that. But unfortunately, <laughs> it's not the case. So he, he was not willing to go that route. They, they have a very good experience defensive line. But I don't know, at this point, I'd put them. I, I, well, you surprised he said it, though. I, mean, I was, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I like that, look, I think to elevate yourself, you have to hold yourself accountable to be something that maybe you're not right now. And so I didn't have a problem with Tim Banks saying that, and I hope that Tennessee does hold themselves accountable to be, we are the best offensive line in the country. We are the best defensive line in the country. We are the best wide receivers. And when we're not, let's find out why not. It doesn't mean you're being braggadocious. It just means this is the level of accountability we hold ourselves to. Mm, I like a little more reality. Um, <laughs> we are, by golly, the best. You ought to see how the claw fence is working in play. <laughs> That's right. We heard but it. We yeah. can't let you in to see it right now. They get so. the ball to people in space. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Deal. So, so I, I don't have a problem with a little bit of hyperbole, um, but at the same time. Or positivity. Or yeah. positivity. Um, but at the same time, I think when you throw that out there. Now, I think 
that'll probably be a lot of it'll be forgotten by yeah. the time spring practice gets here. Yeah. But that that to me was a little much. That yeah. you're the best defensive line. Hey, I, I think he did try and, and uh, back down. Yeah, I this, thought he caught just himself. A little. I mean, I, what about if you just said, "Hey, I think we could have the best defensive line the goal. in the SEC." Yeah. Could could yeah, yeah. I think we could, yeah. and then go with that. I mean, you've got depth, and then especially at defensive tackle, that's where they need to have the best in the SEC, right? Yeah. See, I would have gone. Uh, man, we're going to be really, really good. Yeah. I like our prospects. I feel good about what the we're going to be. Right. Here's the thing, though, and, and this is what people at home need to understand. That's not easy to stand up there every day at a press. I know right. you're always supposed to say the, the right thing. Yeah. You slip once, and guys like us, mm -hmm. me, are sitting here going, <laughs> aha, he said best. It was on every website, every radio. Everybody talked about it this week. Right. Sometimes you just the words come out wrong. And I take that as a grain of salt, especially the way he kind of walked it back right. there. Mm -hmm. I thought it was positive. I was surprised he said it, but I thought it was a positive. Hey, maybe next week you we can gotta, be the best secondary in the country. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> we got it. Was I, I, be that in the that. fall? <laughs> I want to see that. I want to see it in the fall. I don't care about it right now. Vince, you got to get over. You got to get out of here. You're going to do Tennessee, the rubber game, Tennessee versus Ole Miss. Yes, sir, uh, you're not going to get any coaches suspended today, are you? I'm not making any promises like that. Frank Anderson <laughs> taught us yesterday, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, Vince, thanks very much. Thanks, Josh thanks. will come back in here next. We're going to have to blow through the last. Two segments. We got to make our predictions for, for Tennessee Creighton. We got to tell you how far Tennessee is going to go. We're also next going to talk SEC football schedule. Where are Florida State and Clemson going to go? Because that's in the news now. Come on back, much more to go. Welcome back to the Sports Source. This segment brought to you by Games and Things. Folks, if you're looking to build a, a room that will be the envy of the neighborhood, then you need to get to Games and Things because they've got everything. Card tables, pool tables, just the best, the old house and you name it. Home theater seating, they've got jukeboxes, they've got bars and bar stools. You name it, they have it. And when you, when you say that, people go, oh yeah, right. No, seriously, you name it, they've got it. Get down to Games and Things, the corner of Lovell Road and Kingston Pike. See for yourself in their showroom or visit OurGameRoom.com. All right, let's see the poll results. There we go. This is the year is 26%, 16% says, I'll blow it. And 58% of you took the Cavalaris way out. <laughs> <laughs> Halfed it right down the middle, 58%. I never should have done that, but still nervous. I get it. All In right. Chuck's defense, I would have gone that way. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank yeah, you. My, you make coffee nervous. That's, that's the user error in me. I built it the wrong way. All right. Uh, we got to be real quick here. All right. Uh, I'm going to ask one side of you. This side gets one question, this side gets another question. You guys get the first question. SEC has decided to keep the same teams on everyone's schedule for 2025. They're going to stick with the eight-game schedule again. They're just going to flip the opponents. So Tennessee in 2025 is going to get Oklahoma, Arkansas, Georgia, and Vandy here. Alabama, Florida, Kentucky, Mississippi State on the road. Thumbs up, thumbs down to this decision. I will say thumbs up if they go to what they should in 2026, and this is just a, a holdover to make things easy in a two-year run with the new teams coming in. In 2026, they go to a nine-game schedule, which they should, and I've been calling for along with a lot of people for a long time. If not, then come back to this state through some kind of time machine, and I will say terrible move. <laughs> Thumbs down. You get like, bro, it's its opponents. What are you doing? I don't need to see the same people two years in a row. I want to see Texas in football, yes. please. Right. Yeah. Please. That was Give most, us Texas in football. That was the most surprising thing I thought about that. Um, all right, so you guys get another thing. Josh mentioned it depends on whether you go back to the right schedule in 2026. My question is, who's going to be in the league in 2026? Right, Florida, State, Florida State and Clemson both now suing the ACC to get out of there. Don't know that they can, but clearly that league is breaking up. They're trying two different tacks to see if one works. Uh, there's a lot of thought that they could go to the Big Ten. Yeah. They don't seem to fit academically with anybody the Big Ten brings in. The SEC already has South Carolina. They've got Florida. Would those schools want them in? Is there, right. is there value there? Big 12 would love them. Where do Florida State and Clemson land when all this is done? Southeastern Conference, and if I'm Mississippi State, Missouri, and a few other people, I'm really starting to not like this <laughs> because eventually I think those schools, the Trade sorry them. fans of those guys, second-tier schools, I think they're going to go. So, yeah, I think they'll come to the SEC. I think one of the interesting things from what I had read, there's more opposition to adding those teams unless you're trying to yeah. block them to go into, like, the Big Ten but somewhere else. Yeah, that may change. I read right. that, too. One, it got a ton of play. One, I forget which reporter said, I'm hearing sources there's more pushback than there is for it. Like, yeah, until Greg Sankey shows them 
Well, yeah. they're worth X million. And, oh, and, well, and, welcome, and how man. much of the pushbacks yeah. coming from teams who are the little sisters? Well, and I mean, yeah. and in those states, how much, too, how much did maybe. Texas A&M bitching about Texas come? Yeah. How much did that stop Texas? It didn't. Yeah. <laughs> All right, when we come back, Chuck sets the line for Tennessee versus Creighton, and we'll tell you how far the Vols are going to go. Come on back on the sports sources. We race to the end. We motor to the end as Tennessee motors <laughs> to the Motor City. Hey. Surviving in advance. <laughs> Welcome back in this segment of our program brought to you by Express Frame. We are closing in on graduation seasons. Get that diploma, those family photos. Heck, you can even get your mortarboard and tassel framed in a shadow box at Express Frame. Uh, when it comes to protecting your cherished memories, nobody does a better job. Trust Express Frame. Let me tell you, if you walked into my house, it's just like a showroom for Express Frame. Everything, every wall. <laughs> I love these guys. You will too. Express Frame. Uh, and the Common Shopping Center out off uh, Peters Road in West Knoxville. All right, very quickly, Chuck, yes. uh, we got to get your Cavalaris line. You're setting in Tennessee as a three-and-a-half point favorite against Creighton. Yes, I am. Let's go ahead and there we go. Uh, why? I, I just think it's it, either way it's going to be kind of like a one-possession game. Creighton may be playing overtime again. This <laughs> is the best team Tennessee has played, obviously, in the tournament. Inside-outside game, that's what makes them so dangerous. But I think this will be a terrific basketball game if Tennessee's defense can hold up. Okay, very good. So I'm going to start with Josh. We'll work, work around quickly here. Let's let's try and race through this, and then if we have some time at the end, we, we'll just mess around. Uh, Josh, Tennessee versus Creighton. You see the line. Make your pick, and then how far does Tennessee go, period? If, if you don't go with Creighton here, that would tell us. Right, that would be the answer. Uh, I will take Creighton plus the points. Uh, so after, never mind. <laughs> yeah, after, after a few free throws late, Trey Alexander hits a three to, to cut it to two. <laughs> but wow. Tennessee, Tennessee wins the game. I have Tennessee in the Final Four. I had them before the tournament making the Final Four, so but I, will stick, I will stick with that. You have Tennessee in the Final Four? Well, I'm sorry. He's got, he's oh, got Tennessee minus three and a half. Yeah, yeah, I'm taking Creighton plus the points. Creighton to cover. Okay. Creighton Tennessee to cover, to Tennessee to win. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I wow. thought you were taking Creighton. That's period. a narrow window. The cover. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Tennessee, Tennessee wins, Tennessee, Tennessee covers because they hit threes, and for literally no other reason than that, they make it to the Elite Eight. Purdue sends them home. Okay. How far do they make it, in your opinion? Uh, Final Four. Yeah, that's right. You just said yeah. it. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's hard to produce, and yeah. I just don't want to listen to you. <laughs> it's, uh, you you've hosted. You don't want to listen to these when you're hosting. You know that. What did right. you say? Final, <laughs> Final Four. No, it's when you're hosting. Final Four, Elite Eight. I'm going to go Elite Eight. I don't think Tennessee will shoot the ball as badly as they did two games in a row. That gets them past Creighton, and they lose to Purdue. Okay. Chuck? Yeah, I think that, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good uh, evaluation right there, Bob. But a three and a half, I think, is going to be pretty much right on the mark. I'm sticking with my guns. I, I, I said Sweet 16 to begin with. I'm going to stay there. I'm taking Creighton. I uh, hope I'm wrong. hope we're sitting here talking about next, next Sunday. hope we're talking about a possible race to the Final Four. But I just think Creighton's an awfully good team. And yeah, they're, they're, they're balanced. I think it'll Tennessee be a great game. Yeah, right. Tennessee isn't playing its best right now. They've, now, yeah. the defense popped up. They need another game where they can light it up, and I'm just not sure that it wasn't St. Peter's. That helped them light I, it up. I don't think Creighton's playing their best either, though, if you've watched Creighton all right. year. They're yeah. well below their season average Oregon, in scoring. But Oregon almost got them. Yeah. Yeah. And it is Texas a Friday. Texas helped it is, that defense. Right. Yep. It is uh, a Friday, yeah. Sunday. It's going to be three-point defense to me, what it comes down to. Friday, yep. Sunday bracket, like you kind of mentioned, John. Thank goodness. So, yeah. Yeah, we put, the, uh, we put the graphic up early showing that, and that'll be great for us because it means I won't have to sit up till 3.30 on a Saturday night putting <laughs> right. a show together. Uh, but Ooh. Friday, Sunday, I mean, if they can win that one and we're sitting here promo. Well, I remember that was a lot of fun doing that a few years ago when they went up against Michigan State. Yep. Uh, thanks, guys. Appreciate all of you. Appreciate Vince who had to take off. Thanks for watching. We'll see you right back here next Sunday. <laughs>